Hello, I am the High Priest of the Economicon, the Economancer. My life's work is to show you the sacred passages of the Economicon. Today I will be teaching you about one of the greatest sorcerers in the Economicon, Thornstein Veblen. Veblen is commonly referred to as the father of institutionalism, but that is a little less true than him being the father of evolutionary economics. This is an extension of the previous work that we had done in income inequality or inequality in society, social science perspective on social stratification by Jeff Munza and Michael Souter. So we're going to be talking about, obviously, Thornstein Veblen and a lot of these concepts that are going to be coming up. Um, it's, it's really hard to unpack all of it. Uh, I've actually read a lot going into this, more so than just uh, the passages done by him, because it takes a lot to actually break down many of the arguments that Veblen provides in his work. Um, and a lot of them are criticisms of just about everything. So they're not specifically just criticisms of, you know, capitalism or criticisms of uh, Marxism, but all of those are applicable when it comes to this. So we're going to start off with the opening statement that he makes in uh, the theory of leisure, theory of the leisure class. Wherever the institution of private property is found, even in a slightly developed form, the economic process bears the character of a struggle between men for the possession of goods. So the very start of this is called pecuniary emulation. Pecuniary means money. Emulation means to copy. So you can already kind of get what's going on in this just by that word and about the economic forces of men getting the possession of goods, which that's like the foundation for economics that we have is it's not based on money, uh, which is why a lot of the neoclassical models prior to the financial crisis didn't necessarily have a lot of money in it, but that it's about goods and services and things being created, the production of useful goods. And that's something that's very important to Veblen is the production of useful goods. Now, this is the next part. To construe this struggle for wealth as being substantially a struggle for subsistence, he, he says, you know, when we're thinking about people going out for wealth and accumulating wealth, it's not we don't have the incentive to drive that's pure, like biological. It's not just, you know, a, a set of hierarchy of needs that we need physical and all of these things that once we meet that, once we are at subsistence, we, we need to move forward. And how do we move forward? What gives us economic growth? What allows us to move past our just basic biological needs? And that's where pecuniary emulation comes in, because then we see those who have more and we want to emulate that behavior. Now, the motive that lies at the root of ownership is emulation, and the same motive of emulation continues active in the further development of the institution to which it has given rise and in the development of all those features of the social structures which this institution of ownership touches. So this is where first you get into the idea of him being the father of institutionalism as well as the father of uh, evolutionary economics. So he's really giving you an idea that saying the social structure of society um, actually is the motivating changes that happen to institutions. And so what happens in society leads into what happens into the institution. And it's an evolutionary process that we get to, you know, the, the best will win or hope the best will win, really. Um, and then he goes into, ownership began and grew into a human institution on grounds unrelated to the subsistence minimum. Now, this is something that gets brought up as a critique of capitalism that prior to capitalism, you know, there wasn't much of the idea of private property. It was more like a collective property where it was held by uh, a small group of individuals that made up what is the constitution uh, of what is the institution. And now we've moved into, I guess you could say, the more Western personal and private property ideals that kind of have, you know, this this knockover effect that we're, we're moving past subsistence. So now we have to have other ways to formulate society. And this evolution is what's leading into our current institutions. Now, I've done a video on general strain theory. 
and a criticism of it. But I just want to point out that Veblen in his day gave a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of the background information that is used in GST. And you can tell in these quotes how much it mirrors a lot of that. So soon as the possession of property becomes the basis for popular of popular esteem, therefore it becomes also a requisite to that complacency, which we call self-respect. In the community where goods are held in sev severalty, it is necessary in order to his own peace of mind that an individual should possess a large portion of goods as others with whom he is accustomed to class himself and it is extremely gratifying to possess something more than others so right there we're already moving into this general strain theory this idea that you know we, we already have this envious nature about us where we're looking at someone who has more than we do and we're we're really curious on how he accumulates that but we're also looking at him going well he accumulated all of this something that he's doing is working so if i emulate that then I should bear the same results in hopes. And so this kind of leads to an issue that's going to be brought up later. However, widely or equally or fairly it may be distributed, no general increase of the community's wealth can make any approach to satiating this need. Um, and this is, in economics, we call this, you know, uh, local uh, non-satiation. So once you're on your budget constraint, um, any increase in your, you know, in your utility is obviously stopped by your budget constraint. But if you didn't have that budget constraint, you would want infinitely more amount of things. And we, we know this. This is true. Everyone is locally non-satiated. Now, at the end of the day, there may be some individual who's satiated by what they have, but as a general rule, everyone wants to do more. Everybody wants to get more. If my dollar can go just a little bit further, instead of getting two oranges, get three oranges, I'm going to be that much happier. Okay. To a great extent, their emulation shapes the methods and selects the objects of expenditure for personal comfort and decent livelihood. So again, we've moved past, you know, existing and just having goods and stuff and this barter system for existing, we're moving into, okay, we know we can exist now. So all of our expenditures, our personal expenditures are going to be on like creature comforts. And he was really one of the first people to really look at this and go, is this a necessary facet for society? Is this a necessary facet for how we interact with one another? This doesn't make as much sense, especially when you're looking back at this time frame, something around like 1895. It's a little bit more difficult to understand. But as we go into now, we can definitely see that a lot of the creature comforts that we uh, surround ourselves with may not be the best way to spend our money. And this is something, you know, people point out about, well, you know, I. I, I can't survive on my life because I don't make enough. And then, you know, there are others who say, well, you know, you have a $200 phone bill uh, for your cell phone. Do you really need that data? Um, and, you know, this raises the question whether someone does. Many people would say, yes, that it does, because obviously this technology is a part of our lives. This technology is something that we need to interact in society, especially now that we're in uh you know, uh, dealing with lockdowns across the world and stuff like that. So to keep in touch with individuals, it's even more paramount. So this is something that, that gets brought up in a conversation, but he's talking about it here. And I think he's making a really good argument about what is and what isn't good for society that we're going out and purchasing or working towards. In order to gain and to hold the esteem of men, it is not sufficient to merely possess wealth or power. The wealth or power must be put into evidence, for esteem is awarded only on evidence. Now, this is something that we as a society really, really have a problem with. And this is, you know, if anybody's ever read uh, Fight Club, it's a, it's a critique of of capitalism or what we call like post-capitalism society and all of this stuff that we're moving into uh, less scarcity and moving into more of what's called Veblen goods that as the prices increase we're more likely to buy them anyway because they're a luxury good and looking at all these luxury goods and being like well you know I don't need just a belt I need a Gucci belt so 
we're really setting ourselves up to where we're trying to wear as many status symbols as we can in society. Now, is this the best utilization of resources? Again, that's the question that Veblen is really trying to beat into people. In all but the lowest stages of culture, the, the normally constituted man is comforted and upheld by, in his self-respect by decent surroundings and the exemption from menial offices. Again, this is something that rings true today, that when we look around that you can have, I guess you could say, a quaint home and stuff like that, so long as you're happy with what you're doing and that you maintain your self-respect and that you keep what you think is necessary for your life. But the moment you step out of bounds on what is like actually necessary for making you happy as well as what's making your family happy, you're leading into this kind of poor consumption pattern. The direct subjective value of leisure and of other evidence of wealth is no doubt in great part secondary and derivative. It is in part a reflex of the utility of leisure as a means of gaining the respect of others, and in part it is a result of the mental substitution. The performance of labor has been accepted as a conventional evidence of inferior force. Therefore, it comes itself by a mental shortcut to be regarded as intrinsically base. This is a major, major problem in society. And there's actually a lot of memes that kind of point to this, right? It's just like, uh, there was the meme of like the guy collecting trash and stuff. And the, and the, the mother looked at the kid and was like, you know, this is why you go to college. So you don't end up having to do that. I mean, that's a very, very poor way to go through life thinking that, you know, this person has just this menial task um, and that we should look down on them because of what they do. That's not very useful for us as a society because all of these tasks have to be done. And if they're not being completed, then we're not moving forward uh, because people have to be fed. Trash has to be picked up. All of these things have to happen. And when you start degrading these jobs, you're degrading not just the people and the jobs, you're also degrading society because society has to have the backbone done by these menial jobs, which I don't think they're menial. I've done many of these jobs for many years and I felt fully happy with what I was doing because I maintained this idea that I'm just going forward. As the population increases in density and as human relation grow more complex and numerous all the details of life undergo a process of elaboration and selection and in this process of elaboration the use of trophies develops into a system of ranks titles degrees and ex insignia typical examples which are heraldic devices medals and honorary decorations now back in the day heraldry was a very very big deal and we've kind of moved away from that but we haven't moved away from it in all aspects. Now, you're not going to find many people putting too much emphasis now on their heraldry from their ancestors and so on and so forth. But as you, you can see in my background, I actually have some medals and stuff that I have won and some trophies. This is very important to me because these show the status of what I've done. And other people do that as well. So we're emulating this behavior, this seeking to be the best and to have this competitive drive and we're emulating and creating you know differences in our society by our wants and needs to show ourselves different than others in society and so if you're thinking about this from the inequality context we're actually creating inequality in and of itself by trying to be different from everybody else if i try much harder for something than someone else and we go and compete in that task and I win and they don't, then we have kind of set up the society saying you have to work to do this. Now we move into conspicuous consumption of valuable means is a means of repu reputability to the gentleman of leisure. As wealth accumulates on his hands, his own unaided effort will not avail to sufficiently put his opulence in evidence by this method. The aid of friends and competitors is therefore brought in by resorting to the giving of valuable presents, expensive feasts, and entertainment. So, 
just me being really, really good doesn't give me enough social status. And going back to Weber and what he was talking about, about building social status. So just because I'm rich, just because I meet all these things doesn't mean I max out my level of status. So now I have to bring in friends, people I know, other individuals within my class, the leisure class. And this kind of sets up like this consistent feedback effect where you're now creating a class that's separating itself from everybody by only working for the parties within each other, right? So they'll actually throw feasts, they'll give each other presents and stuff like that. And this is something we can see um, like movie stars, for an example, you know, when they go to these events, you know, they're given a bag, it's full of presents. Some of them, some people might be paid to be doing uh, a talk or a, or a song or something like that at these events. But essentially, this is setting up its own internal society, which is the next part that he brings in about, you know, class and how it's even subdivided. Now, the, the, the best way to think about this is he goes into a little bit more work, which I'm not going to quote him entirely on this. Um, he goes into pointing out, okay, so what does the leisure class do? What is this conspicuous consumption? Or what are they giving back to society if they're, you know, if they're having this conspicuous consumption? Is it is it useful for society to have this? Well, he goes into the idea that immaterial goods uh, as a function of the leisure class. Now, what is an immaterial good? He defines it as like quasi-artistic, quasi-artistic or scholarly work. Um, they don't produce something of great value for furthering human activity. And it's, it's kind of an unproductive expenditure of time. So if you have two people, for an example, one is an artist, he makes paintings. And then you have another one, he is the plumber. Which one is society going to value more for moving humanity forward? Well, you could very well say that the creativity of the artist may move society forward, but a lot of people would say, you know, to move society forward, we have to maintain what we have. So obviously the plumber is going to be of utmost importance because without the plumber, without the, the trash man, society will eventually collapse. And that's a big, big problem that we have to think about. Okay. So then he goes into the differentiation of leisure class, right? So so one of the differentiations he points out is inheritance and geniality um, and also the genility of the leisure class, that they're very gentle, that, you know, and this is kind of, we don't really have this idea now, which is something that we'll get into in a minute, but we, we don't think of them as gentle. But at the time they were considered very gentle, you know, that, that's why they had the gentleman class. They, uh, they tried to embody a lot of the work, uh, of what was considered Lancelot, right? The chivalrous order where you're very strong and powerful, but you'll also be the one to cry in front of people. And so this was what they were emulating. The, the I guess you could say the medieval to Victorian period ideals of the perfect man of chivalry. And they, they assumed that that's what they were working towards, but he's kind of pointing out that, you know, they're only working towards half of that, of, of being very soft and gentle, but it's not very good because what they lack in self strength, they, uh, they emanate something Machiavellian, uh, something kind of, Bad in the sense that they'll use manipulative techniques to get what they want rather than just, you know, outright force. Um, and then he points at this further class subdivision uh, comes from vicarious consumers or what we might call now sycophants. People that are that attach themselves to those of the leisure class. They want to like parasitically live off the leisure class. Now they're still doing work and they're still doing stuff for them. You could point this to like, you know, very high paid uh, secretaries of CEOs. Like obviously they're not as important as the CEOs in people's eyes, but obviously they are very important to the CEO and they hold a very, very big status in our life. Whereas if I was, you know, a secretary at a local doctor's office, that would be like, okay, you're a secretary, secretary at a local doctor's office, but we have this individual here. They're a secretary at, you know, uh, they're a secretary for the CEO of Barnes and Nobles. Like that 
is a subdivision within its own class. Now, obviously, there's going to be, you know, a material difference between the two based on pay. But this social difference, this status difference is just as immense, even though they're essentially a part of the same job construct. Um, and that's one of the reasons why people do this. They kind of go out and try to work towards, you know, this increase of their honor. So that's one of the ways he puts it, the honorable or the ignoble classes that we set up ourselves up. Like it's not noble to be a secretary, but it is noble to be a secretary given that you're working for like this very famous CEO or this, you know, this very big thing. Um, and so we're trying to separate these titles. And I'll give you another example that he used is the King's master of the horse. Now, just being someone who watches over horses or takes care of a horse wasn't considered a very good thing. It was just like, okay, so you watch over a horse, but society treated the King's master of the horse significantly different. And that was because his honor was bestowed by the leisure class. So now we have this secondary separation within this class or within this like job construct. And then he goes into the vicarious leisure of the wife. Um, and this is kind of, he was really one of the best proponents of, you know, moving women into the workforce. He thought that the idea that the woman would stay at home and take care of the house while the man worked, he thought that wasn't very good for society. He was like, this doesn't actually benefit society very much. Um, and that this doesn't necessarily apply to the leisure class, which is actually the big problem because he has the women are emulating this leisure class. They're the function of pecuniary emulation where they're stuck at the house and they're in the you know middle to low income uh, classes. They're, they're essentially still chattel. Whereas, you know, the rich women obviously can do almost whatever they want. Um, and they also apply a function for our society, right? So th it's it's really easy to see that, you know, the, the trophy wife trope that may be useful uh, back then was something that was important because you were trying to establish yourself, present yourself, do this entertainment and these gifts. Um, and that allows you for an increased social status. Whereas, you know, if you have your wife, uh, who's also in this with you, she is also a function of you increasing the social status. Whereas in the lower and middle classes, they're just, they're just emulating this. They're like, well, you know, obviously the rich people aren't working. So my wife, even though I'll work, my wife can stay home. She's emulating this, uh, leisure class. Uh, all she has to do is take care of stuff. And he was like, and his idea was like, this was a taught problem for Western society. And we actually see a lot of that in today's critiques of, you know, the housewife and stuff like that. This led into, you know, the feminist revolution um, and where we're at in society now where, you know, I think it was second wave feminism that was really against the idea of that. So a lot of that comes directly from his work and looking at the pecuniary emulation of, of women and how they were basically bound in society by our taught processes to to do this and that the men were taught to just love it because that's what they do but there was no like logic behind it because we're actually seeing this like this loss of resources because we don't have these other people working in society and making society better and so that was a significant problem that he wanted to point it out um so essentially Veblen's like first economic critique of economic growth is that it's not a function of subsistence and that it's just a function of uh, this dominance hierarchy. And that has, you know, nothing to do with the distribution of resources. So he didn't really care so much about the distribution of resources in so much as, you know, money. But what he said is that these social statuses are conditioned on the money and then how society perceives that. Um, he calls the motive of pecuniary emulation an incentive structure where the private marginal uh, return of wealth informs of social status and creates a positive feedback loop. Um, and this is something very similar that I had stated in the Weber context that Weber said, well, it's not that it is economic class that separates, it's that 
it's conditioned upon the economic class that even if you solve for, you know, the bourgeoisie and proletariat issue, you're still going to have these social and party class differences that's not solved by just the materialist argument. And that's something that Veblen's saying here, but he's not going so much into party as Weber did. Here he's saying we're continuously even disaggregating the classes themselves through this pecuniary emulation. Um, he also points to, you know, the subdivision that I talked about of uh, lower classes and how it's, it's for the emulation of reputation. Um, one of the best ways to think about it, if you take a blacksmith and when he's young, I guess you could say he's trying to emulate the older, the more beautiful works. He's, it's almost artistic. Whereas he gets older, he's just trying to get it done. He's already figured out all the tips and tricks that he's going to be able to accumulate over his life. So now he's just going through and his status is raised because he's been going through it and he's already done all of these things. So we're creating within this society, this class between the two. So we're subdividing even the poor classes. And what used to be based on just self-respect that I had the best product and that's why I worked so hard. Now it's not that I have the best product and I work so hard. It could very easily be something along the lines of nepotism or, you know, my cousin knew this guy who knew the king and therefore got me this, this job. And so it's not so much about meritocracy as it is, you know, how I can interact with the leisure class. And this is, this is, again, this is still a very good conflict that we have in our society where are we actually basing everything on meritocracy? And, you know, he also points out that society as we know of it has moved from the barbarian class where labor and strength was actually thought of as the best thing to have. And then we moved into this predatory society, as he refers to it, where physical labor is degrading. And that's what I was talking about earlier. And those are really the important points for looking at the pecuniary emulation and how Veblen saw inequality in society. Now, here's one of the normal criticisms of Veblen. He did not foresee the structural changes that we have in society. We actually have very large structural changes. Uh, I'll give you an example. We don't necessarily uh, think about pecuniary emulation as much anymore um, because we don't look at a leisure class anymore. We still have conspicuous consumption, but it's not based on leisure. It's based on, you know, Veblen goods and stuff like that. What I mean by that is, you know, in the 1890s, wealth was accumulated through ownership as well as, you know, being lazy, not working, setting up all of these, you know, parties and entertainment because you had either inherited wealth or you own large parts of land or you own large corporations. That's not as true anymore. And the reason why I say that is because you go to like YouTube videos for all these famous CEOs like Elon Musk, for example, they're like, oh yeah, I, I don't have leisure time. All I do is work. I'm working 70, 80 hours a week at minimum. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm constantly on call between all of my associates across the world. I have to be able to get in touch with them at that moment. And I think that that has removed the idea of this leisure class and it's moved into this working rich class, even though you're the owner, even though you're the bourgeoisie, you're still putting in significant amounts of work. And I think that this is very important for society. And it's something that's driven us into higher levels of growth through these structural changes. And it has, you know, codified itself to some extent into our culture, excuse me, and our institutions. And I think we can all agree that that's something that's significantly different from what he said. Another criticism of Veblen is that a lot of people don't like his anti-materialist argument. He was, he basically essentially said that the materialist argument for Marxism isn't very useful. 
um, similar to what Weber said that, you know, we're still going to have these problems in society because, you know, we're still going to, we're still going to emulate those who have more than us, whether it's more social status, party status, or economic status, because even in a, you know, egalitarian, uh, society, there's going to be differences, which I'm not saying that Marx was pro egalitarian. What I'm saying is that these differences, no matter what the system is, is still going to be, uh, there. And then the last criticism of Veblen really is that I don't think he foresaw what the impact the institutions have in the reverse ordering, right? So he says that institutions are an evolution of society. Now, some people think that it's the other way around, that society is an evolutionary byproduct of the institutions, which I know that sounds crazy, right? So how can we have this? Well, we can think of it in reverse causal ordering. So if if A causes B, but B also causes A, then we have this like reverse causality where, okay, we had a society, for example, America set up this system. Uh, the Constitution, uh, private property rights, and all of this, more laissez-faire capitalism. Now, it has evolved over time. Now, society, in, to some extent, has, you know, fundamentally been the creator of this evolution. But at the same time, the original document has allowed this fundamental change. And that's very important to know that the, the changes that are being made, the evolution that is being made is a function of the institution itself and how it impacts society. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, there's a lot of people that point to, you know, what was written in the Constitution, what was written in the, um, the Notice of Independence to England. And how has this shaped society? Well, obviously, people point to this being like, hey, you know, this is the reason why we need the civil rights movement, because this was said, you know, 100 years, 200 years prior that, you know, and this continues, uh, that this was written, you know, I, I'm being deprived of my life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. And so they'll kind of move everything and be like, well, the institution caused this. Now, it's because of people looking at the institution and seeing this. So that's what I mean by that reverse causal ordering. And I think he put too much emphasis on society uh, causing institution, whereas I think institution plays a very large role in causing society. There's actually other work being done into this by uh, Giovanni Dosi. Anyway, I hope you've come away with knowing a lot more from the Economicon. Uh, I am the Economancer. Please like, share, subscribe. I think the next one will be Du Bois. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm probably not, but have a wonderful day and thank you very much.